Through some fluke and terrible luck I fell on a needle in the streets and it lodged itself with an end in two different bones, requiring surgery to remove. It was considered an emergency surgery and you can imagine the possible health hazards involved with this situation. The problem was that there was no anesthesiologist available, so they opened me up awake and conscious whilst cutting into my hand. Here comes the shocker, they let a rookie operate on me and that moron was cutting through nerves in my hand while I was awake. I was screaming bloody murder, told them to close up my hand and that I would be going to a private hospital, my aunt and uncle were removed from the premises and I was tied down so they could continue operating. Under my understanding of the law, and the dozen lawyers I talked to, I was kidnapped and tortured by hospital staff. I left the operating room in a catatonic state five hours later with a needle still in my hand, unable to even feel it due to severed nerves. I got operated the next morning at a private hospital, where they removed the needles, while I was under full anesthesia and the doctors repaired what nerve damage they could. I filed for a lawsuit but the hospital denied ever admitting me and had no records of me. Welcome to hell on earth, also known as Brazil. Finally a place to share my story. I'm a Syrian guy, and I served in the Syrian army. I left the Syrian army a few months after March 2011 and joined my buddies in protests. Long story short, I was identified in one of the videos of protests and I was taken from my home. Day zero, it's around 2200 hours. People knock on our door, and father opens. They ask for me. My father says I'm not home. They storm inside and look for me. I'm taken in by jamas and thrown in the back of pickup car. You want freedom you son of a? And they beat me a lot. I'm now in the black site, aviation intelligence department. I'm thrown in a tiny dark room with 15 other people. There's no way we can all stand. Smell of piss and crap and sweat is unbearable, my brain blocks it after a couple of hours. Day 1. I wake up hearing where's the soldier spy son of a? Arabic. I'm taken to a room with a big black wheel hanging from the wall. I'm now blindfolded. I'm seated inside the wheel and left there for one hour. A big man walks in the room, he whips me with what I learned later is a heavy duty electrical wire. Who's paying you? He asks after whipping me for 10 minutes. Nobody, I answer. Looks like you're gonna make this difficult for us, huh? He continues whipping me. I can feel my blood seeping, very weird feeling, like warm chocolate on your arm, and a small puddle forming in the tire. I pass out. Day 2, wake up you animal. I'm taken to the same room, but this time I'm seated on a chair. No blindfold. My feet are tied to the chair, so are my arms. The same guy walks in and starts hitting me on the shins with a thick stick. The pain is horrible. He did that for 5 minutes. Then he punched me in the face a few times. I lost two teeth. Who's paying you, you, something that would take a few paragraphs to explain. I answer I swear nobody is paying me. Please let me go. He starts punching me in the chest, kidney, face, and kicking on the shin and stepping on my toes. One more punch to my face and I pass out. I wake up when two men are carrying me back to my cell. Day 3, I wake up in my cell, a 1 by 0.5 meter cell. There's no way to lay down. The door opens, I'm taken to a different room. Today we'll execute you. Tell us what you know so you can go in peace, I was told. I can see nothing with my left eye and can barely see anything with my right one. I'm taken to a different room. I'm hanged from my hands to the ceiling about 20 centimeters above the ground. I'm now being whipped with what I thought was the same cable. By this time, my wounds started to have a very sharp pain, and it was difficult for me to concentrate on the new pain. I'm hungry, thirsty, and can barely stay awake even though I'm being whipped. I pass out. Day 4, I started forgetting which day it is. My brain can't work correctly. Same thing. Whipping, punching, every day. Now they want to know who are my buddies, whether we have guns or not, etc. Like all the days, the torture ends when I pass out. Day 21, I tried hitting my head on the wall to kill myself, I can't. I tried to strangle myself, I passed out before I died. I wanted to make the screaming stop. So many people screaming. I don't care about myself now, I just want that woman to stop screaming. They're hurting her. Later I learned that they raped her and killed her in front of her husband. They killed him as well. Day 34 they realized that I genuinely have no information for them or for some other reason, I have no clue. They made me sign a paper thanking the president and saying that I was treated very well. I was driven and left somewhere outside my city. A car stopped for me and the guy drove me home. I knocked on the door, my mother opens and starts crying. I stayed in the hospital three weeks after that. 
I had multiple infections on my body. I nearly lost sight in my left eye because an infection from my own poop. My nose is still crooked till this day. I can't sleep in the dark, and I'll never ever trust anybody with anything in my life. One day I'll be avenged, I hope. I am female. My uncle was a pedophile with a sadistic streak, and he started molesting me when I was 5. The summer when I was 12, he interrupted me while I was taking a bubble bath in his jacuzzi tub and tortured me by dunking me over and over. When he first came in, I threatened to scream for my aunt, and he told me that she was gone to the grocery store and to please scream as loud as I wanted. I expected him to rape me immediately, but first he washed and conditioned my hair and combed it out. Then he grabbed me by the hair and held me face down in the water that was about 2 degrees short of scalding. My vision started to go black, but I managed to get my foot hooked around the tap. When I flipped myself over, though, I also turned on the hot water. He hit my head against the marble and dunked me again until I started to pass out. He pulled me out, let me take a deep breath, and then dunked me again and again. There is nothing worse than being drowned. I thought I was going to die. I must have stopped breathing completely at some point because when I woke up he was giving me CPR. I coughed up what felt like a gallon of soapy water and then he raped me. My uncle is alive and well. I haven't seen him in 11 years. I pushed it all to the back of my mind for the longest time. I pressed charges when I was 16, and the whole process was hell. I asked to be allowed to testify via video feed, but the prosecutor refused, saying that that was normally only done for children and insisted that it would do me good to face him. They made me feel like I was weak, when really I was just aware of what I could and couldn't handle. I had terrible PTSD, crippling depression, and anxiety attacks, and all evidence was long gone. Plus I was a wild child as a teen and there were some inconsistencies in my story, especially the parts that happened when I was very young. I knew the defense was going to rake me over the coals, and I was extremely reluctant to put myself through that when I was finally starting to heal. I didn't want revenge, I just wanted it to be over. The trial was pushed back over and over and the district attorney's office kept reassigning the case to different prosecutors. The lawyer who ultimately closed the case was only assigned to it a week before jury selection, and the trial was scheduled to take place during finals week of my senior year of high school. When my mom called the DA's office the Friday before jury selection, we learned that just that morning he had pleaded no contest to injury to a child and got off with 5 years probation and a $500 fine. Apparently the new prosecutor had seen notes in the file indicating my reluctance to testify and decided to let him plea out without even calling us first. Since all he admitted to was giving me inappropriate massages, he doesn't have to register as a sex offender. Knowing that his free makes my blood boil, but I don't regret sparing myself from what I know would have been a humiliating, miserable trial. Went to jail after a fistfight during a road trip with my traveling companion. Police shackled my ankles through the cell bars at the foot of the bench, shackled my hands together and took a weightlifting belt that they looped between the handcuffs and a bar a couple feet beyond the other end of the bench. They tightened the belt as much as they could so I was stretched enough that most of my weight was suspended between the bars. They latched the belt and left me hanging for 8 hours. I screamed the whole time, my hands turned purple, then a dark blue. When they released the tension the capillaries in my hands had burst and I couldn't lower my hands below my heart level without severe pain for days. Both of my rotator cuffs were torn. Charges were dropped. I made an account for this story and it's not one I usually share. I had the fortune of being born in the impoverished former Soviet Republic of Ukraine. When I was 5 in 1997 my tonsils swelled up and I had severe trouble breathing, and my mother took me to the hospital to have my tonsils removed. I was 5 so I didn't understand so I was relatively calm. This is 90s Ukraine, the equivalent of Great Depression America but worse. While hospitals often had trained and professional doctors certain medical supplies were a rarity including anesthesia. I was taken to a room tied down my mouth pried open and my tonsils were removed. I don't remember how long it lasted, maybe 5 to 10 minutes but at the end I remember I was covered in blood. The experience left me with a massive phobia of dentists, every time I go to the dentist I'm on Valium and even then I'm shaking and sweating uncontrollably. It's not something I usually share because in America this kind of stuff only happens in Eli Roth films. While I remember some specific painful details you'll have to forgive me because they are not easy to reimagine or write down. In first grade, I was just shy of six and started kindergarten early. My teacher found a textbook that someone had written my name in, repeatedly with a crayon. It was clearly the writing of a child, my name written a half dozen times, from top to bottom on the inside back cover. 
My teacher accused me of doing it, but I had not. The more she accused me, the more I denied. The more I denied, the angrier she became. Soon she was screaming in my face, swearing at me, demanding that I confess, but I refused. We were sitting at the kind of desk where the top opens to reveal a storage area underneath for notebooks, pencils, etc. She told me to get my things out of the desk as I was to go to the principal's office. When I reached inside she slammed my arms with the desktop, then asked if I was ready to confess. I refused, so she told me to get my things again. I didn't want to get my arms slammed again, so I refused. She demanded I get my things, and I continued to refuse. She became so angry she grabbed my arm, lifted the desktop, stuck my hand inside and slammed the top again. She repeated this about a dozen times asking between each slam if I was ready to confess. I never did confess, and she eventually stopped when a number of other kids started crying. I told my parents what happened when I got home from school. There was a big stink at school the next day, I had to tell the story of what happened to a number of people. I never saw the teacher again. It really wasn't me who wrote in the book. I was tied up in a house fire. My former husband was extremely mentally and physically abusive. I was leaving him and he decided that if I was going to leave, we were all going to go. I ended up escaping, I was tied to a chair, after he passed out from the flames. He and the dog died in the house, which was burnt to the ground. The only thing that got me through it was knowing that he was trying to kill me, I was able to seek help properly. I think about it every day. When I was really young, over a period of years when I was 5 to 8 years old, my mother used to punish me for wrongdoing by giving me forced enemas. The physical and emotional terror was severe. It happened at least five times. The memories are a little hazy. She thought she owned my body, she thought she knew what was best for me, and she justified the act of forcibly inserting the hard plastic tip of the enema machine into my body, as I sobbed in shame and horror and helplessness by saying it was good for my health. It hurt, it was incredibly physically unpleasant, but probably unsurprisingly, the thing I took away from it was. Body shame or whatever else emotionally abused kids carry into adulthood. My boyfriend was a sadist. While I was concussed, and thus my memory and judgment severely impaired, he started to take advantage of me. He would enforce rules. If I made a sound, I would be beaten or whipped 5 to 20 times at the end of the session, depending on his mood. He would keep track and it would usually culminate into a very severe beating at the end. He liked to electrically shock me, especially on my groin. A few times, he would tie me up, blindfold, gag me, and then he would sell me to others. It would usually end with me begging him to just beat me instead of selling me. Honestly, the list of terrible things he did to me goes on and on. It lasted for six months. I finally got away by switching schools, though I was switching schools for a different reason on the outside. I managed to get through the rest of high school and into college. I was an emotional wreck. I'm a pretty blunt person in general so I became rather frank about my experiences. A lot of friends stopped talking to me after I gave a speech about it at my high school. They said I talked about my past too much. My programming kicked in, if you speak or make a sound, you'll be punished, and I stopped talking about it at all for a while, but I got new friends in college and eventually they found out what happened. They stayed with me through all my constant panic attacks, flashbacks, drunken episodes. I'm in my last year of college, honestly, I look back and it seems like a completely different life. While I still have the occasional episode, I have overall dealt with the trauma well. My psychologist says I have an overly logic nature, which actually greatly aided in my overall recovery. I have a boyfriend. We have taken things very slow, he knows everything. He's the best thing to happen to me. He's patient and never pushes or pressures me. It will always be a part of my life. But as time goes on, it will ever become smaller and smaller, and thus more insignificant. I have great friends and a boyfriend, I'm doing incredibly well in school and in my research. I'm grateful.